Praise the Lord. And uh, let's get this done. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for all the sharing. And uh, I enjoy all the sharing, the messages and uh, and uh, communion. And uh, Midland is always good. And you can see how each one has uh, different gifts. Whenever Bin Lan share, it's always very uh, precise to the point, and uh, it's always a very deep topic. And thank you for the worship today and uh, and calling on your sharing. Praise the Lord. I appreciate all the sharing. And of course, uh, those of you who are leaders uh, in this move, uh, whenever you have something that the Lord has placed in your heart to share, can always inform uh, Colin, who is coordinating everything, so that we make sure that you have some time to share either on Friday or on Sunday. But always, as uh, but as always, I will take the responsibility and the burden to share every uh, meeting, and it's a joy to share. But of course, uh, I would also enjoy if any one of you. Uh, have a special word or leading from the Lord to share some. Praise God. And um, we are going to continue on this uh, concluding series on uh, uh, Bible prosperity. And last week, we introduced the subject of uh, prosperity to grace. And I more or less thought that I have uh, completed it. But as I prayed over it, I felt that there's still some more parts to uh, share to make sure that we all understand the concept of prosperity to grace. Uh, so if you have your Bible, let's turn to our key text, which is in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, which says as follows. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Now, many messages ago in this series, I think probably about three or four or five, that uh, I talk about just this verse and explain what this verse means. And, uh, but today I want to expand on the word grace and uh, how grace imparts into our life and how we can benefit through understanding how this grace works. Well, it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the first part of the verse. But last week and, and today too, I am focusing on uh, the second part, which uh, on this, on this uh, first, verse, uh, first part of this verse. The second part of the verse, uh, that Jesus, though he was rich for your sake, became poor that we might become rich. That part was shared in a full message uh, several weeks ago. And I focus on what Jesus reaches man and uh, how it translates into our life. So if you miss that message, please hear that message again. How Jesus, uh, who was rich, became poor that we might be made rich. I touch on that. But last week and this week, I touched on the first part of the verse, which is, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then to understand how prosperity comes to grace. And in line with that is also because God showed something. And I've always been thinking about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is when it's realized. Because we have no church historical um, example, there's none. The closest we have is the book of Acts. But I have tried to trace it in all of church history. Uh, perhaps there's a small little glimpse here and there. And it is very hard to bring about a move in which you cannot fully quantify or visualize in details. But thank God that through visions and downloads that God 
has shown more clarity and more details uh, in order for us to conceive it in our heart and then bring it about by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then I will touch on the third point, especially uh, on what the kingdom of God is like and some concepts that he has shown about how the kingdom of God is ruled and run on earth during its limited time that it functioned before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, or what we know as the rapture. But let me introduce the first two points first to help us understand basic concepts of grace. So there are three points, as you can see today, in, uh, in what we're about to share. And this is like a part two continue from last week of prosperity to grace. We have touched on this grace as equal to strength. Remember last week, we quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we are looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 onwards. It says here, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, it's interesting that to tap on this aspect of grace, one must discover one's weakness in order to tap on the strength that comes to replace that weakness. I have also given some equations last week when Paul mentioned here, uh, quoting Jesus' words in verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I say it looks like grace equals strength. It says my grace, my strength. And that's the first concept of grace that I want to point to Grace works in many ways. Grace, firstly, is a substance. It's a substance that works in us. Grace is also a position. And it's a position of grace and favor with God. We all sometimes play with the acronym GRACE, G R A C E. And we say it's God's reaches at Christ's expense, which is not a bad acronym. Before the New Testament, there have been Bible words that use the word grace. And um, its meaning is similar, but we know that grace is especially New Testament and not Old Testament. But you have a semblance of grace in the Old Testament. And you have verses like Genesis 6 verse 8 that says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So what does that mean? And then, especially when God was talking to Moses, God says, you have found grace in my eyes. Well, what does it mean when it says Noah found grace in the eyes of God? It means that when God looked at him, God looks at him differently from everybody else. And the word grace is a Hebrew word, hen. Yes, it's exactly like the spelling of the chicken, H-E-N. But uh, it's pronounced in the Hebrew, 
and it means graciousness, but the root of the word uh, hand uh, in the authorized version, which means the King James Version, the word hand in the Hebrew has been translated 38 times as grace, uh, 26 times as favor, two times as gracious, one time as blessing, one time as precious, and uh, uh, one time as uh, wealth favored. So when no one found grace in the eyes of God, it means that when God looks at the planet Earth, there's one guy that he looks differently. Something about Noah makes God look at Noah differently. And I want to show that Old Testament grace is more closer to the word favor. Where God, although it's a different Hebrew word, which we will have a look afterwards, which is more the word hasad. But here is the word uh, uh, hen, H-E-N in Hebrew, which is translated as grace and sometimes as favor. But then favor has another Hebrew word, especially when it occurs together. But it looks like when Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, that grace was more like a position of favor, a place where God looks at him differently, a place of favor. Well, let's uh, consider some other verses like uh, in chapter 33 of Hebrews from verse 12 onwards. Uh, you have a lot of conversation with the word grace inside. And uh, it's found in uh, within verse 12 to verse 17. Uh, it occurs at least five times. And it's all the same Hebrew word, H-E-N, hen. And all this is before verse 18, where Moses says, Please show me your glory. Now, of course, if you are in the position where God is listening to you and you're listening to God, when you ask God for something, it's almost like instant. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean that when you ask for something and it is not instant, it doesn't mean that you didn't have the grace of God. Because Jesus Throughout his 30 years, he was already praying, but those things did not take place because it was not the fullness of time. The same way Abraham, well, God made a covenant with him in Genesis 15. When he asked God, when, when, when God promised him a son, then he asked God, how will I know that this is going to happen? How will I know this is actually going to happen? And at that time, he was possibly in his late 70s. But if you like, you can round off to 80 because he came out at 75. He spent a few, sometime in Egypt, then sometime around uh, the land of Canaan. Uh, he will be still in his late 70s, but you think he spent five years, which I think is only about three years. But easy to count by round numbers. If he was 80, then we know that he has at least 20 more years to go before he actually has a child. So Noah, uh, Abraham wanted to know, how will I know that this will take, come to pass, no matter how long it takes? And Genesis 15, God made a covenant with him. Now, a covenant, as I say, is better than a human contract today when you buy a house, when you buy things, when you do business, when you buy and sell, everything has a contract. And sometimes you've got to sign a lot of paperwork. I remember when I signed for the childcare lease in Parramatta and because they are huge, big company and we are just a tiny little operator, small business, and they own the whole building and all we wanted to rent was just the ground floor. Uh, I remember the paper was the, the paper we signed was about one and a half inches thick, nearly two inches thick. Now I signed many lease agreements before. On average, they are about 10 to 15 to 20 pages, but this was that thick and they covered everything they can. Uh, now, so 
uh, we know that in human terms, contracts are important. Uh, any breaking of the contract, you can sue a person for not keeping their part of the contract. It's a legal document that can bankrupt you if especially you sign a contract with a bank and you didn't honor your payments. Uh, and even between businesses, they can sue one another. And a contract is a serious thing that you don't simply sign. You need to know thoroughly and you need to engage a lawyer who knows what uh, the thing is. So obviously, God's covenant is better than human contracts and uh, because a covenant involves life. A contract usually involves money, materials, or goods. So when God make a promise and make a covenant, according to the Bible, God saw to Abraham. And in Romans, it quotes two immutable things. God himself as a person and his word. When God gives his word, it's as good as gold. So bear in mind for any one of you who have visions, dreams, revelations, downloads, uh, rhema, words of God, or promises or things in your life, know that what God says, he will surely bring it to pass. It's as good as receiving a contract. And you can file it and you know it's going to happen. If you sign a contract to buy a house that is being built in three years, it's as good as go. As long as you keep all the payments up, you, you fulfill your part of the contract, then the party who builds it has to fulfill that part of the contract too. So we take it as serious as, as it's done. And so the moment you sign it, even though you don't materially have it yet, it might not be built, or even uh, if you have the keys later, it's as good as done. You say, hey, you bought a house. Um, so we know how real a contract is. Mind you, a covenant is thousands, if not millions of times even more better. So when God makes a covenant, it is done. It's as good as done. You don't even have to doubt. It's filed in a heavenly contract. Trust God's word. It will always come to pass. So I illustrate that to show that even though it takes nearly 20 years of Moses' life before what God promised came to pass, Mo, uh, of Abraham's life, Abraham did find grace in the sight of God. So it doesn't mean that if God didn't answer instantly that his grace was not working. Sometimes it has to work in the fullness of time. Just as in the fullness of time, all the wealth of the planet will be under our hands. It's only a matter of time in Isaiah 60 and it's a part of this revival that God is bringing for, And I explain why that will happen and the purposes of it in the third point. So here we are digging into the first and the second point. In, I'm giving some old, exam, old Testament examples of how grace is different in the Old Testament than in the New. In the Old Testament, grace seems to be a position rather than a substance. And you know the difference between a position and a substance. A substance is something that can be uh, transported. A position could be like you receive uh, a position uh, in your company. And that position is important. You might be promoted from uh, a uh, manager to senior manager, or you could be a secretary and you got promoted to uh, head secretary uh, or chief secretary. You might be uh, a medical doctor. You, you got promoted to head a whole group of doctors. You're the chief uh, among uh, the group, the 
or medical doctor. So there are different levels, different position. But a position is a position, it's not a substance. A substance will be something like blood. Uh, blood is a substance. And uh, today, you know, people can uh, donate their blood. Uh, and it's a substance that can be uh, trans uh, transmitted to another person as, as long as it's, it doesn't carry sickness and disease. So a substance is different from a position. You can call uh, the ha uh, a house uh, position in a certain place. And a house, of course, is a material substance and is in a position. But it's not a liquid su substance. You couldn't liquef liquefy the house. Uh, although today they have technology to move a building. But uh, a substance is something more like water uh, that can take any shape and form. So that's a substance uh, that can be transported, etc. So here, looking again at the Old Testament, grace in Exodus 33, verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up these people. But you have not let me know whom you, you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name. You have also found grace in my sight. See the word grace? And it's the same word in Hebrew, hen, H-E-N. Now, therefore, I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. See, Moses is playing on the idea that grace is favor with God. And he's saying, God, you've given me favor. You say you know my name. You say, you say that you really know me. And I have found favor in your sight. Then remember me. Remember the people. Remember all these things. So he's talking. If you interchange the word grace with favor, it still fits. And he said, he continued praying and said, and then the Lord answered in verse 14, my presence will go with you, I will give you rest. Then Moses said in verse 15, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace, flesh, favor in your sight, except you go with us. So we shall be separate your people and I from all the people on the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you have spoken. You have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. Now, doesn't that sound like grace is a position rather than a substance? It does. Because in the Old Testament, grace was a position which still continue, you know, anything in the old still continue to the new, except in a more glorified form. So grace has always been a position, a position of favor with God. And then in that position, Moses said in verse 18, he added extra thing and says, please show me your glory. Now that's an additional asking. Since you have found so much favor, so much favor, God said, can I also see your glory? And the answer in the end was yes, except God cannot reveal to him all the glory, although Moses would die. So he said, I show you the back parts of my glory. Let's just summarize a long story there. But you know where this is leading, and you can see from the usage that um, the word grace is closer to the word favor, and it's always emphasizing the word position. Now, let's have one where grace and favor come together. Shall we? Let's look at the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 17. Esther, chapter 2, verse 17. And this is from the human side, not from God's side. But I like it because both the word Hebrew word grace and favor come together in one verse. So if grace equals favor, what happens if grace and favor are two different Hebrew words? That will make it interesting. Well, in Esther, if you have, in chapter 2, verse 17, this from the human side. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she, this 
There is a human grace and favor, nothing to do with God, but it's good illustration. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So here you have the two words come together. Grace and favor. But we are interested in the Hebrew. The word grace is still the Hebrew word hand. And the word favor is the word has said. H-E-S-E-D, which is a totally different Hebrew word. The word hesed is closer to the word mercy. And it has been translated 248 times as mercy. Uh, uh, 149 times as mercy. It occurs 248 times, sorry. 149 of those times is translated mercy, 40 times as kindness, 30 times as loving kindness, and uh, then you also have um, goodness translated 12 times, kindly 5 times, merciful 4 times, and in favor three times, good one time, goodliness one time, pity one time, reproach one time. And we could think, must be a negative part of it, one time. So you have that mainly is translated mercy. Now, what is the difference between grace and mercy? We have put it together in a new, because we said that of the seven spirits, one of the spirits, is the spirit of mercy, and the other angle is grace, like joy and glory. Joy is very different from glory, but yet it's an aspect of glory. Just like truth and love. Truth is totally different from love in concept, in theology, in perception, in experience. To experience truth and to experience love by itself is totally different. But yet, they are two dimensions of the same thing. Truth and love. Without truth, there cannot be true love. It will be formed on the basis of lies. And without love, you cannot truly discover truth. So the two are related in the seven spirits. So we ask a question, if hesed has been translated favor less times than mercy, then is the king saying to Queen Esther, she has grace and favor. She has hand and hesed. She has favor and mercy. Now, what's the difference between favor and mercy? If we translate hand as favor and has said as mercy, what's the difference between favor and mercy? We all know that mercy is given when one deserves the opposite, condemnation. That's when mercy is shown. But at the same time, mercy is not necessarily the opposite of condemnation. Mercy can be given to those who deserve no condemnation out of pure kindness, out of the goodness of God, the pure kindness and loving kindness of God. He shows mercy. He's merciful. Uh, so you ask for an example of that. Let's say... Uh, an archangel manifests in his full size. He will be planet size. And you know, the planet itself is quite big, although it's the, uh, smaller than the sun by many, many times and a tiny part in the universe or in our, even our solar system is, is less than a dot. And so if an angel manifests as, as the size of the planet and the angel were to touch you, 
because of its pure size and energy and strength, the angel will have to be very gentle just to, just to give you a tap on the shoulder. If you put it too strong, you will probably have your whole shoulder broken to pieces. And so, kindness and mercy is shown when the angel is gentle and merciful knowing that we cannot take his strength. The angel in which Jacob wrestled with was actually being very merciful. He could have killed Jacob. And so mercy is not necessarily shown because one is condemned. It is when one is powerful, showing to one who is, in comparison, almost like powerless. You have to be super merciful. Otherwise, you might kill a person with your energy. So mercy is the word has set closer to its usage. But when used together, translated here, grace and favor is understood to be that way. Bound to point out that there are many other verses which we don't have time to cover, but we can show that grace is a position in the Old Testament, and it remains a position in the New Testament. And, uh, but there's something more here which I want to point to. The word hand comes from a very interesting root, hanan, which means to bend, to stoop in kindness to one who is vastly inferior. So you can see that, that there is a sense of one is so high, one is so low, vastly inferior. And the word hand means that I give you favor and some level of kindness and grace. So remember this word, please. There is a lowliness involved in the word hand. It's like a, a tiny little ant before a human being. Because a swarm of ants is, is something powerful against a human being. But one tiny little ant against a human being. And of course, we can just squash the ant. So if you want to show kindness to the ant, you have to be super gentle to a very inferior creature. So there is like a bending down, a lowering of oneself to the level of the tiny little end which you can keep in a little matchbox. That's the word hand involved. There is a sense of lowliness to receive the grace. Remember that the word H-E-N in Hebrew has a sense of being in the lowly position so that you can receive the grace, the position, or the favor. Then the word favor in the Old Testament is the word uh, hasat. The root word is the word hasa, and you change the E to a, an A, H-A-S-A-D. And the word hasa has a sense of uh, like a courtesy, and a sense of um, uh, like uh, a sense of like showing uh, mercifulness kind of thing. And in bringing things you don't deserve. Mercy is never deserved. If you deserve mercy, it's no more mercy. Some sort of undeserved uh, thing that is shown uh, to one. And you can see the various usage, a primitive root, uh, properly perhaps to bow the neck only. That means like the neck go. Whereas in hand, it is like, like you're going to bow 
down to this inferior creature going to be so low. Whereas, you know, what has said is kind of thing, like an acknowledgement and uh, uh, in courtesy to an equal. That means God raise you up and treat you as an equal. That's the word has said, which is the word mercy. In other words, God treat you as an equal. Whereas the other word, grace or hand, is like, you know, you're inferior and yet you're given some benefits. Here is like you're lifted up and you're treated as an equal. The sense behind the two words seems similar. They look almost like synonyms. You can interchange grace and favor or grace and mercy, but they have slightly technically different picture allegories. Again, hasad is equality, which you don't deserve, out of mercy. And hand is like one has to give some sort of favor to an inferior creature. So grace and favor, those are two interesting words. We could continue in the Old Testament and this sermon will go very, very long. And I shall not do that. I just have sufficient touch on that to show you the Hebrew words. And then now I want to move into the New Testament in the book of Romans chapter 5 to show that grace is still a position in the New Testament. Except that now, grace, which is the Greek word, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, charis, covers the word hand and covers the word hasat in the Old Testament Hebrew. The word charis in Greek covers many areas, plus more. And it's many derivations, like charis can have charisma, becomes gifts, and uh, then you have uh, eucharist, which has to do with the uh, thanksgiving. And then uh, a form of eucharist in its noun relates to the communion, the Lord's Supper, which is uh, a covenant thing. And today they retain the words, I believe, in the Catholic Church, in some high churches. And they say these are the elements of the eucharist. And the, the root word inside is the word carries. The word you means good, and carries means grace, literally translated. So the Greek word expands into many meanings. But we want to point to the fact that grace is still a position in the new. So you have here in chapter 5 of Romans, verse 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, obviously, a position. We stand into that. So we have positional grace. I call it positional grace. It positions you as an equal, where you are as and join as with Christ. Isn't that wonderful? We don't deserve it. We are unworthy of it. But Jesus, through his precious blood, through his salvation, through his atonement, made us as and join as. Isn't that equality as a gift? Through grace. So grace is definitely still a position. A position of equality, a position of favor. It includes every concept of the Old Testament plus more. But in the New Testament, grace is a substance that can produce strength. We already touched on that in 2 Corinthians 12, where my grace equals my strength to bring us into perfection. So grace is also a substance. So we have positional grace. We have the substance of grace. Now the substance of grace, when it comes into us, 
It energizes us. It gives you more energy than you would normally have. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we read last week, and uh, I'll read it again in 1 Corinthians 15, and it should be around verse 10. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labor more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. So how can he labor more abundantly? Because that grace is the supernatural substance of strength inside him. Then you have uh, Gospel of John. In John, it tells us about our Lord Jesus, and this was the words used of Jesus in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was full of grace and truth. Now, how can you... A position is a position. You can't use a word describing full of grace because it's describing Jesus as a container. He contained the fullness of grace. So here, these are references of grace as a substance. The substance of grace was in him. And this grace is almost like faith. You know, there are adjectives added to faith. An adjective is something that describes a noun, like great faith, weak faith, strong faith, and all these adjectives that are added to faith describe faith. So faith is definitely a substance. That can, you can have a little faith, you can have a lot of faith. Uh, Stephen was full of faith. So there is a description of a substance. You can have a cup full of water or a cup half filled with water, a cup with little water. These are words you can use to describe faith because it's a substance. And these are things you can describe grace. Because suddenly in the New Testament, grace has become a substance. It was not revealed as a substance in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, it was extensively referred to as a substance. And some people have more of this substance, some people have less. Now, if that grace is going to produce favor, you do want to have more of this substance of grace. In the New Testament, they even described the church had in Acts 4, which we look after later in the third point, great grace. Great grace was upon them. That's X5. Great grace. And then a lot of things happen. X4, X5, you know, great grace. So how can grace be great? It's surpassing every level. And it was uh, also in the whole group of people, not just on one person. Obviously, grace is a substance. Now, these two things I have taught even in my, now, nowadays I say my ancient teachings, I'm like ancient of days. Uh, from long ago when I teach grace, I've been talking about grace in these two formats. In fact, uh, by the grace of God, uh, we introduced that subject uh, long ago to New Creation Church. And Joseph Prince was so enamored by the subject, he says, Wow, I didn't see grace in that way. And he has taken the grace message further and emphasized uh, grace all, uh, goes along. But along the way, today he has focused more on the position of grace and neglected the substance of grace. And um, because the substance is more emphasized in the New Testament than the position, because it's the Old Testament that emphasizes the position. 
uh, when you emphasize the position, you might end up doing nothing because Jesus did everything for you to achieve that position, position of faith and grace, as an equal of God, as and joint heirs. But we emphasize the substance. Within the substance, the dynamics of little and more and how grace can grow strong, and how you can increase grace through the knowledge of God. So when that comes in, it, it brings a level of works, but not ordinary works, works that are done to grace and the energy of God. And that is why when people don't hear the grace message soundly, they become lazy. They say, why should I read Bible? Jesus already did it for me. Why should I pray? Jesus did all the praying for me. Why should I uh, 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 do, uh, do more, more works? Jesus did all the works for me. So it produced a lazy mentality when you emphasize on the position of grace, when you didn't see the other part that grace is a substance. And that substance can be more, can be less, depending on how you walk with God, depending on how you yield to God. And the more you yield to God, the more it can flow through you. And it makes you more hardworking, not lazy. Paul says, I labor more because there's more strength now in me. Like this is how much you can do as a human being. With the grace of God, this is how much you can do. So you can see you can do more because my grace equals my strength. Obviously, a substance inside. One more verse for that area. In the book of... Um, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. He tells Timothy, You therefore, my son, be strong, and there's the word strength, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, the word be strong is the Greek word endunamo, which means to be strong from the inside. Again, emphasizing grace as a substance, as an energy, as a spiritual substance on your inside. I believe I've shown to Old Testament, New Testament, through the verses, the understanding very clearly that grace is both a position and a substance. So, like in maths, we say QED. That's it. Done. But this is one to speak about today. I want you to look at something differently. And that is that there are things you can control and there are things you cannot control. No one, even a control freak, can control everything on this planet or around their lives. Control freaks try to control everything that they can, but then they are so extreme that they drive every person away and they become, uh, nobody likes to socialize with them after some time. In life, there will always be things you can control and there will always be things that are outside your control. If you haven't found it yet, you're still a baby and a child. You know, babies and children are that way. They always think they can control everything. And uh, when they reach an age where they become more aware, so they throw a tantrum to control things. And sometimes babies succeed, little children succeed, because every time they cry, the parents run to them. And so they learn crying is good because I can get everybody's attention. And then later on, the child keeps getting everybody's attention, throw this, throw that. And if your house is ruled by every whims and fancies of your child, you are a disgusting parent. Because parents make the rule, not the children. And so the children should not control all the time, you know, what time you sleep, what time you wake up. Uh, when you can go out, when you can come in. Of course, when you begin, the child is still a baby, you're training the child. Is your life going to run around when your child goes to the toilet, when your child needs to pee? Let's say your manager, your engineer, your doctor, your school teacher, 
Are you going to be controlled by when your child go have feces, when the child pee, when the child needs you? No. You as a parent set the standard. Then you train the child to respect the schedule of the parents. You will give in to a certain extent. Then after some time, the child is toilet trained. What happens if the child is not toilet trained under 20 year old person? Cannot, right? The first thing every child learns is toilet training. Then they learn they can control. And it's not every time they cannot control. So it's important to learn that in life, there are some things that are in your control. There are some things you cannot control. Little children have to learn that. And then at some stage, they grow up, they realize, hey, they are not in control of everything. And then they learn when to give in, when to let go when to respect that other people have their own control of different things. A child cannot tell the parents, oh, today I like to take uh, the left lane, uh, tomorrow I like the right lane. The parents say, hey, I'm on my way to work. This is the best way avoiding traffic jam. I'm not on a tour here. I'm getting from here to work. So they learn the parent is in control. So those who don't learn that you cannot control everything in life, you will end up as a big baby and you will end up with, this, with, with frustration because you keep banging your head against the wall. And of course, you can gather around a group of people who you can control. But in the end, all the people around you are frightened of you and they are yes men, which are useless people. All you want is people to agree with you, to say amen to everything you speak out of your mouth, whether right or wrong. So you're a control freak. And F-R-E-A-K is the right word. You're a freak of nature. You're a mutant. Your DNA is wrong. And we grow up to be adults, we recognize there are some things in life you can control. And there are some things you do not control. God will control. And you also learn that some things that, are that you would control, you let God control. Wow, that is a bigger surrender too. Because you could control, but you learn that when you control, it doesn't do as well as when God controls. All right? When God is in control of your business, of your job, of your situation, things are better. So you learn how to walk with God. So I would like to divide all our lives into two parts. Your internal life, which you can control, and your external life, which you can't control. Of course, some internal things are expressed externally within your control. Like for example, you can choose afterward to have a cup of coffee or a cup of chocolate or a cup of tea. So what I mean by external is not that. There is an internal control which is working out within your hands to reach. So there are certain things which are within your control. There are certain things that are outside your control. Now, this is how grace works. The things within your control would require the substance of grace. That means you learn how to control it through the energy of grace and not your own energy. You learn to maintain it through the energy of grace, which is inside you, is internal, is endunamo, inside you. Be strong in the grace of God. 
and you learn to appropriate this substance of grace so that your energy is endless. It comes from grace. It comes from God. Then the things that are outside your control, you depend on grace as a position. Now, positional control and substance control is two different things. How do you control what you can control through the grace of God? And we learn as disciples of Jesus, we learn that one of the first things God asks of our life is, all to Jesus I surrender, all to thee I freely give, I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. And I surrender all. Right? We learn. We learn how to surrender all to God. So that it is no longer we who live, but Christ who lives to us. So there is no longer our flesh energy, but the energy of grace. So that we learn that it is not our carnality and flesh, but the spiritual energy that flows within us. So we need the substance of grace to control what is assigned for us to control. You control it by grace, not through tantrums, not through your flesh, not through your control, not through your threats, not through anything of the flesh, but by grace. You need a substance of grace. Now, the more substance of grace you have, the more control and energy you can have to maintain that control. How do we receive this substance of God's energy? When Paul wrote to Timothy and told him in 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, Timothy, my son, be strong in the grace of God. How to be strong? Paul himself, when he was wrestling with the fallen angel, three times he prayed, and only after that, God answered, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul has to wrestle to that. How do we get more of the substance of grace? The key is humility. The more humble you become, the greater the grace works in you. It's the opposite. Instead of becoming more proud and more of a control freak, you become more humble. The more humble you have, actually you have more control. And I don't have to read to you the verse that is found in James and in Peter. God receives the proud and gives grace to the humble. So you obtain the substance of grace through humility through humbling yourself. The more you humble yourself on your knees, humble your heart before God, the more grace you have. And the opposite is proud. The more proud you become, the less grace you have. Until you reach a point where you're so super proud, God himself got to slap you and push you down and resist you. Now notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul was talking about less he become proud through the many revelations. God allowed a fallen angel to buffet him to learn that despite all his revelations and download, he still lived by the grace of God and depend on the strength of God not on his own knowledge, not on his own intelligence, 
not on his own wisdom. So Paul learned when he is weak, then he is strong. Now, to humble yourself is also to put yourself in a weak position, though you're strong, because you depend on God and not on yourself. Isn't it that the things, you know, the things we can control, sometimes we have to control so much, we become proud and we become like self-achievement rather than Christ achieving it through us. So the key in the substance of grace, which is for the things that we can control, is surprisingly, the more weak we are, the more strength we have from God. The more we come to the end of our own strength, the more we can tap on the grace of God. And that ties to the word H-E-N in Hebrew, which has a sense of lowliness. That the more humble we are, the greater the grace. The more proud we become, the less the grace. And if you are not living by the grace of God in the substance of God's grace, you tire easily. You are discouraged easily. You are frustrated easily because you're depending on your own intelligence, your own wisdom, your own knowledge instead of the grace of God. And instead of humbling yourself before God, you're always in your sense of pride and self-knowledge. And you're going to knock yourself over and over again until you realize, unless Jesus helps, we can do nothing. So that's the substance of grace. You apply it to the things that you're responsible to control. Now, the things outside your control you need positional grace. Now, how do you operate positional grace that is a gift for you, that comes also to Christ and is a position of favor that you have been given in God? There's one word. To substance of grace, the one word is humble, humility. To positional grace, things that are not in your control, that you rely on God to control. There's also one word. Love. Love. In things that you cannot control, you, can, you must choose to love God with first love. Every time you love God with first love, even though it's outside your control, God will control it for you. And even the bad things, he will turn it for good. And the confusing things, he will turn it to peaceful things. The most uh, greatest tornadoes, hurricanes, typhoons, Things that will weep and crush and destroy all around you that beyond human control. You have a sense of not directly control, but making sure that all the wild energy that is wrecking havoc around you, sometimes by the enemy, sometimes energy released by the enemy or human or demons or fallen angels, and sometimes by humans, that no matter what they do, as long as you love God with first love. Romans 8 verse 28, grace will work for you. All things work for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. Even the most extreme persecution will work out in your favor if you choose to love God. You see many Bible stories. You know the story of, uh, in the book of Esther of Mordecai versus Haman. 
Haman tricked the king into signing a decree that on a certain day, he, he can put all the Jews to death because he found out Mordecai was a Jew and he hated Mordecai. But God turned the whole situation around so that the day that was supposed to kill the Jews, the king issued a second decree, decree that says, on that day, the Jews can avenge themselves, they can take up arms and defend themselves, and they can do whatever they want to defend themselves and save themselves. And the Jews, by the second degree, use that same day to destroy their enemies. Instead of the day that was designed to destroy them became the day they destroyed the enemy. And the guillotine that was made by Mordecai, uh, made by Haman. Haman actually designed the guillotine to chop off the head of Mordecai. And he went to the king's palace early in the morning because that morning he wanted to ask for the head of Mordecai. And the story tells us in the end, he was the one who got chopped by the same guillotine he built for Mordecai. Haman, the enemy of Mordecai, died on his own guillotine. The enemy will destroy themselves. Their own destructiveness destroy themselves. And there's nothing that Mordecai had to do. All he was doing was fasting and praying, repenting, and just loving God. And do you know that very night in which the next morning Mordecai was said, going to be dead man, where Haman got up early the next morning to ask for Mordecai's head, that very night, things beyond Mordecai's control, the king could not sleep. And in his uh, sleeplessness, he asked to read the archives and records of what was happening in his kingdom. And the angels, without Mordecai's control, make sure that the story the king heard that night was about something good Mordecai did. You think about coincidence upon coincidence upon coincidence. Things that Mordecai has no control. And then night, after hearing this, the king said, was Mordecai ever rewarded for, for exposing people who wanted to kill me? He says, no. So the king was thinking how to reward him. And as the king was thinking how to reward him, by that time he had a, a sleepless night and it was already early morning, and Haman was there to kill Mordecai, in the head of the king, he wants to reward Mordecai. Think about it. Who on the planet Earth can plan in such a way an event that has to do with Mordecai's life, which Mordecai could not control? He had no authority. He had no power. He has no influence. But God and the angels make sure that same morning, the king would have the thought, I want to reward Mordecai. And the enemy had put the thought in Haman, I want to kill Mordecai. And guess who won? God. So if you want the grace of God to work, something has been added and transformed and changed in the new. Besides Romans uh, Roman said 28, in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And it's a quotation from Isaiah 64. It says in verse 9, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. If you want the position of grace and greater grace, love God, 
beyond all others. Right now, as we all stand in different parts of the world, or you're sitting comfortably wherever you are, we all potentially are as and join as with Christ, correct? But some of us are receiving more positional grace where God is controlling circumstances around us than others because your love was greater than another. So now, we cannot choose how much God loves us because He's very determined. God all loves us all equally. But we all can choose to love God more. Unfortunately, God loves us all equally, but we all do not love God equally. Some of us love God more than others. And the more you love God, the more positional grace works on your behalf. Now, this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, comes from Isaiah 64, verse 4. And it says in verse 4 of Isaiah 64, since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, nor has the eye seen any God beside you who acts for the one who waits for him. Do you hear the word there? He acts for the one who waits for him. Now, how did that verse change into the word love? From wait on him, Paul read it as who love him. The word wait in Isaiah 64 verse 4 is the word Haka. Haka has a meaning of way to tarry law. And it has a meaning of piercing. That means you will wait out of the depths of your heart. That is why Paul transliterated it into love. The word haka is originally from the word uh, haga, haka, which is Q, is the K. And it means like to be printed, to be a carved piece of work. And it speaks of Something that God looks at and God says, this is my work. This is me doing that work, my carving, my beautiful work. So it throws back to God having full control. Those who wait on God <clears throat> in Isaiah 64 verse 4, it's like waiting <clears throat> for God to take control rather than they control themselves. And when God controls, it becomes fixed so that there's no way the work of the enemy can destroy you because you choose to love God. What he meant for destruction turn out for good. Isn't that marvelous? As long as you choose to love God, everything that human beings, demons, fallen angels, and the devil throw at you turn out to be good. It's a powerful thing. We just have to make sure we wait on God to control. That means you wait. To wait implies a position. You wait in the position of grace for God to work. 
And Paul adds <clears throat> that waiting position include love towards God. So love for God is might look passive, but when God works, it produces miracles. He saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. Because they say, if God don't save us, we will still love him. If God save us, we will also be grateful. They didn't put themselves, they say God has to do only one thing. They, they let go the control. They say, we know our God can save us. But if we don't want to save us, we will still love him. So they were not like in one track mind. They were open to God controlling it in any way, anyhow he wants. Even if they go on to risk their own lives as martyrs, so be it. That is true, pure love. If any one of you have gone through a bad situation, if you make mistakes in your life, no matter what your past, no matter what your present, no matter what your situation is, if you will not give up, you know the saddest thing? Saddest thing is in those situations, most people give God up. They stop waiting on God. They stop loving God. They get frustrated at God. They start blaming God and they start blaming people. If in all situations, you keep choosing to love God, no matter how difficult, sometimes you have to love God with your heart tear to pieces and your eyes fill with tears like Jeremiah under Jeremiah says, his eyes were like rivers. But God worked all things out for good for the Israelite people who suffered in his time. How many tears were shed during the time that the Israelites were waiting in Egypt for Moses to deliver them? How much pain and suffering they bore. But every tear, every pain, every whiplash they received from a taskmaster was paid for to their children's children's children when they took all the gold and blessings of Egypt out with them to form a nation. They still benefited. So never stop loving God. Never stop being passionate for God. Because it is the key to turn around your situation. To receive positional grace. You must never stop loving God. Think about it. How can you become an heir and join us with Christ manifest? Unless you love Jesus, obviously. Because it's Jesus sharing his riches with you. So you stop loving Jesus, how can Jesus share it with you? you? Say, oh, he loves you unconditionally. Yes, but it's not flowing to you because there's a blockage. You must love God to tap on position of grace. Then there is the third, which I say is the most precious and, and, and final third point. And the third point, first I talk about substance of grace. And uh, then I talk about positional grace. And the uh, third point that I want to speak about is just simply called the grace of our Lord Jesus. That means there's something more that comes from our King of Kings and Lord of now, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as a phrase is a powerful thing. And um, you see here in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, the first verse that I started with when we began. For you know, and here's a phrase, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, this one is not talking about just the substance of grace. It includes it. Of course, it's Jesus' strength. Not just positional grace, which of course it is because it's still Jesus' position that he gave to us. But this is the fullness of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for our sins, he became poor that we through sporty might be made rich. He shared all of that which he had with the Father with us. And this phrase is so powerful, it's used in many ways. In Romans 16, verse 20, it says, And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And sometimes it's used as a greeting all the time. At the end of it, it always says, in verse 24, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you as a benediction. And the same benediction is there in Corinthians 16, verse 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It's some sort of a blessing that they keep blessing each other. And um, that continues on in Galatians 6, 18. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Philippians 4, 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5, 28. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. 2 Thessalonians 3, 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And Philemon 1, 25. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you with your spirit, amen, and Revelation 22, 21, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. There is this blessing that goes right through to the book of Revelation. And I ask God, what's the fullness of this? And the Lord showed me what the glimpse of the kingdom of God. And these are the things the Lord says when the grace of Lord Jesus Christ is fulfilled in the church. Number one, there will be no more poor people. Say, so is there a Bible precedent? Yes. In Acts, in the book of Acts, we see here, that in Acts chapter 4, that something happened to the church as the power of God was upon them. Actually, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 32, now the multitude of those who believe were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they are all things in common and with, and with great power, the apostles give witness to the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them all. See the word great grace? Great grace. Uh, the word great is um, actually uh, uh, from the word mega, the Greek. So it's mega grace uh, that was upon all of them. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands or houses, sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. And Joseph, Barnabas himself, was involved, having land, he sold it, brought to the apostles' feet, and later on he grew to become an apostle. The Lord showed me a glimpse of the kingdom of God many. Because I say, Lord, I don't think church history is anything on record. I say, what will we do in this revival? Today, in our modern world and in the past history of Christianity, we have mega churches, mega ministries. They become rich. Some of them have airplanes. Some of them own. Uh, they become rich through their ministry all over, all the way, even Africa, from Africa to America, all. And the Lord showed me, he says, 
all, see all these things happening? They use the wealth for themselves. Then I say, yes, Lord, I understand. What are you trying to show me? And then the Lord showed me. And he says, the kingdom of God on earth is supposed to be like the kingdom of heaven on earth. And then the Lord asked this question. In heaven, do people have to work for food, clothing, shelter? He says, no. You know, when we all go to heaven, none of us have to work for food, clothing, shelter. All right? Everything is free, given by the Father. And then the Lord says, in the kingdom that I will manifest, oh, there will be so much blessings. And I want the blessings to be used so that everyone who is a part of the end time church will never again have to think about food, clothing, and shelter like they have to on the planet Earth, even though they're on the planet. I say, how, Lord? That's a lot. And the Lord says, I will bless my people. So I saw the end time church. And I saw that we were organized as nations of glory. And for smaller nations, we group them together. They form, a, they, they, they were allowed to choose their own leaders. But they were supervised by apostles and prophets <coughs> who were anointed of God. And they were allowed to govern to a certain extent, like parliamentarians, representatives chosen by the people. It's some level of democracy. But then I saw you know, today in parliaments, you have always um, uh, the elected representations, and then you have the senators, the other house, the upper house and the lower house. The lower house where people are elected, the upper house are more selected. And to pass any law, you need to pass both houses. So I saw that we had a sort of government that has representation of the best among the people. Like the book of Acts 6, they chose good men filled, filled with the Holy Spirit. Then I had a look at the other side, the upper house, which is like the senators that's, that had to confirm any law passed to benefit the countries or nations of glory. Because we are six billion strong, don't forget. And I saw that those who are on the upper house, they had transformation. They had no needs. When you're transformed, you don't need food. You actually don't need a shelter. You don't even need clothes because you could. You, you, you experience supernatural clothes. And, you know, it's almost like, your transformation is food, clothing, and shelter is not something that is even necessary for you. So I saw this like spiritually transformed group of people at different levels. And then the people who play the parliamentary roles, the people that haven't achieved their status yet, but they have to help to run the whole kingdom of God on earth. And it was quite a harmonious thing. And I saw that the first thing that is always done was that they care for everyone. Every person who gets converted and comes in enters into like a place of provision. We would have places of refuge, places like uh, uh, there's a sign for that provide food and uh, produce food and uh, different people with skills taking care of them. But basically, everyone didn't have to think about food, clothing, shelter. They say, what do they do? And the second thing that I saw was, yes, the question, what do they do? There were two types of training. There was a training for people to get prepared for heaven. They were trained in theology, trained in spiritual laws, and they were trained so that they can also transform. 
and become like this other group who have no need of food cleaning shelter, literally. And it was like a spiritual training. And part of it was, of course, evangelism, bringing people in, uh, training people to share the gospel, evangelism, all the basic training. But, but the greater training was preparing them for heaven, teaching people the laws of heaven. And it was like, like we were preparing people for the rapture, for heavenly, to live in heaven, to progress while on earth. And then the third area of training was, was part of training and working an organization of praise and worship all over the earth. Praise and worship was a main theme. Uh, evangelism was still there, but evangelism was easy because signs and wonders bring, bring the multitudes. And, and all the multitudes, uh, those who can, they were absorbed into this worship, full-time worship. Can you imagine... Let's start with a small figure. A billion people who don't have to worry about food, clothing, clothing and shelter on earth. They all have more than enough. Plus more. And all they have to think about is how to serve God all on earth. That's powerful. So I saw that was what was happening. And I said, wow. It will be glorious. And of course, there'll be imperfections here and there that try to creep in, you know, uh, especially those who are not renewing their mind. They might have a bit of greed, then they got sorted out. Mistakes are made, they got sorted out, but less mistakes on those who are transformed. So you get these two groups in the church, but at least the one group was helping the other group. And they say, wow, when you have 1 billion people and there's more than enough finances to support them all the way full time until Jesus comes again, what are they going to do? A lot of us are worshippers. Some of us are training. Some of us, of course, enjoy the different works like agriculture, uh, different, different things, uh, natural things uh, that, that, that can use the talents of people. And when I saw that going, I said, wow, I never knew that we will reach a situation where we could provide food, clothing, and shelter for one billion, then later six billion. Think about how much wealth you need to have and keep producing. That's powerful. Can you imagine? Because many of you are struggling with food, clothing, and shelter, or providing food, including shelter, is occupying a large part of your time. When that part is taken care and you could be free to love God and serve God. And the energy of God is supplied. And the presence of God is there. And sometimes angels will come and teach us more about things in heaven. In some of our Bible schools. What a powerful environment it's going to be. And of course I ask God, is there a glimpse of this in the Bible? And God says, yes. In the book of Acts 4, they have eliminated needs, food, clothing, and shelter, the need for clothing and shelter in my kingdom. And Jesus called his church his kingdom in, in my dialogue. The sad thing is it did not last long. It was a glimpse. And then, of course, there was no one sick. There were no sicknesses that could not be healed. The fulfillment of Deuteronomy 28, Exodus chapter uh, 15, and Acts 5, and they were all healed in verse 16. Of course, out in the natural world, we still have orphanages, uh, and different homes for the elderly, and uh, those with different people at different levels of growth, and there's still hospitals with natural treatments and all those things, while the people were growing the spiritual treatment. But the good news is, they were all healed. So I saw this extent, extensively, and I said, wow, it's really a different type of parliament. 
who are managing the needs of the people. And since everyone is on a fixed uh, sufficient amount, uh, more than sufficient amount to live, they, you know, it was a very beautiful equality that was there that uh, area are more than enough for clothing or shelter, plus more. And so the management was what to do, what to do, and these things and that thing, and all these things that were running on. And this is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the fullness of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ manifests on earth, as in heaven, we will see the kingdom of God. Manifest. We will have the nations of glory and the elimination of all those things that came about because of the fall of Adam and Eve. We will have people exercising spiritual power as they do agriculture. They will have the powers of the age to come. It will be like a mini glimpse of the millennium to come. They got allowed pre-rapture. It's a powerful rank. In a millennium, all food clothing shelter is supplied. Limitless. And there's supernatural provision, supernatural multiplication until everyone got used to signs and wonders and miracles. You can have as much gold as you need. Your own gold mines, your own money, you own agriculture. It's more than sufficient for everyone. And people organizing the distribution system for those who need natural food and all those things. What a beautiful vision of a glimpse of heaven on earth. And we little vessels just doing each our little part. The kingdom of God on earth. Let's pray. Father, we pray that this vision that you show come to pass. We pray, Father God, that we will taste of what heaven can be even while on earth. When we eliminate sin, we eliminate needs, we eliminate sickness and disease, all your people are free to give you praise, worship, and love. And everyone is involved in caring for each other. This is your kingdom. Thank you, Father. Let it be according to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Now, uh, pass you on to Colin to coordinate the questions and answer. I'm going to have a sip of water. All right, so if you have questions, you can uh, post it in the chat or you can also unmute yourself. Hi, hi, Pastor, how, how are you? Hey, praise the Lord. Hi, um, uh, this is Sir Lisa. Um, first, I just want to say that is um, such a blessed um, sermon. I mean, that was just so power packed. I'm just, wow. And I just thank God for that. Um, it's a, a lot of questions were answered that I did have questions about um, tonight. Um, but I do want to, you know, give you a quick update about some events that's been going on in my life. Um, and I just have three quick questions. I'm going to be really quick. And um, I just want to say that I have a lot of mutants on my job. <laughs> A lot of people like to control things. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, you know, um, the first question I, I just want to ask you, um, I've been hearing the Lord say he's putting another level of light in my life and authority and um, in order, in order. And my tongues are changing. And um, I noticed that um, when you would say things are happening instantly, I noticed that when I pray that some things are shifting instantly, like instantly. Um, because, and I just want to, I don't, I don't know what he's doing. 
Um, but some things shift in my life, like my income is great to double and all by your teachings. I mean, ever since I've been here, I've seen a major change in my life. Um, the second thing, um, you know, the other week I had, it was on Mother's Day, on Mother's Day night. I, I don't know what happened. I know I talked to a lot of people and maybe some energy or something got mixed up. And when I went to bed that night, I just didn't feel right. So I felt kind of like a heaviness around me. So um, and I asked the Lord to remove it and I prayed and it didn't go away. And I said, well, Lord, you know, you know, where are you, Lord? You know, what, what, you know, what is this? So it didn't go away. So I just prayed and went on and went to sleep. So when I went to sleep, um, as soon as I, as soon as my eyes shut, I woke right up in the spirit room. And when I woke up in the spirit room, I lifted up my pants and I felt like the atmosphere was just really thick. It was a lot of resistance. I, I, I don't know where it came from. So my spirit actually got up off the bed and walked around the first level of my house and I anointed my house in the spirit room. And this was not a dream. I walked around my house and I said, oh my. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say, now lift your hands up again and start praising me. And once I did that, the atmosphere shifted. It was gone. I went back to sleep and I said, whoa, I feel peace. Wow. And I said, oh, good Lord. So, and, and, and you know, and that's something that's happening. Um, and then just last night, because when I praise God, I had the type of job that I really don't do anything. I just sit there. So I just praise God. I praise God for three hours straight on my job. And um, and I just sit there and just be praising God. I don't, I don't even really, really work that much. And um, and last night, I don't even know if I slept faster. I was praising God in my sleep. My mind, my spirit was praising God. I, I don't even know if I slept. What, what, what does all that mean? I, I mean, I'm like, okay, Lord, I should be sleeping. Am I asleep? Uh, am I awake? I'm praising you. I'm praising you in my mind. I can see it in my consciousness. I don't even know I slept last night. And when I woke up this morning, I was still praising God. I'm like, okay, something's happening. <laughs> um, so I just want to know like, what is happening with me or what is God doing? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I know that was a lot. <laughs> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, that's yes, good. Sir. That's good experience. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, I, I just want to know, like, what does that mean? Like, when I'm, I don't even sleep. I'm praising God, and uh, and me waking up and walking around my house and anointing my house in the spirit realm. I mean, what is happening? It's, it's a good, I will call it a good experience. And uh, uh, the Lord took me uh, uh, during the time of the phase uh, when I moved into the future dimension. Uh, for six weeks, every time I sleep, I'm taken to heaven. So it's like I didn't sleep, but it came back to my body, that's all. And so I would say that what you experience is uh, out of body experience, uh, that uh, your body is sleeping, but your spirit was still doing things, and then they join back together. And those kind of experiences are going to become more and more common because our body still needs its various rest until it's transformed, but our spirit does not. And so God continues to use that. And so what you have is an out of body experience. And sometimes it can be so dramatized and so real, uh, dynamic, that even Paul himself says he knows a man who has gone to third heaven. He was not even sure whether it was in body or in spirit because it was so real. So that's good. And just enjoy it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm really, it's really another level of light because all last week I was just feeling light to like, um, like I'd be feeling sparkly, like I'm waking up out of my sleep, I'm feeling all these sparklies in me, like sparkly, and it's waking me up out of my sleep, and it's light, it's light, and I kept hearing the Lord talk about light, I mean, all last week it was like light, 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 but I'm praising God, it's light, and it's waking me up out of my sleep, it's light, and I feel sparkly on the inside, is that, what is, what, is that anointed, or is something, it's tangible, it's, it's sparkly. It's yes, it's sparkly. Yeah. 
oh, oh my goodness, it's very tangible. Mm. It's, it's very tangible. Mm. Uh, yes. Okay, thank, thank you, Pastor. No worries. So a question coming out, how would the government, the empire, the kingdom of God uh, be organized? It will be sort of like um, uh, nations of glory when uh, representative of different nations uh, are elected in a way of Acts chapter 6 by the selection of the deacons and they send forth and they help to uh, govern uh, all the people and all their necessities on the earth, but the, they are supervised by another group of people who are transformed. When you're transformed, you are not limited by the natural, so they can serve in what I call the spiritual dimension of the government. And so it will be like a sense of a government of spiritual dimension, with some earthly functions. Uh, that's the best I can describe what it's going to be like. And um, the things that they will be involved in won't be like politics and war or elections or other mundane things that all countries uh, do all the time, but they will be more in the area of caring caring for the people who are in the kingdom, caring for them to make sure all are healed and cared for, uh, caring for them in food, clothing and shelter, caring for them in uh, giving them uh, spiritual jobs to do, assigning them into different training areas and to train others uh, ready for heaven. And in terms of organization of, um, of uh, the worship team in all the different countries. And the primary role of the church is in praise and worship. And that is the army of God in praise and worship. Next question, Pastor. If the substance of faith is a measure, is it related to the measure of faith that is given to each one like in Romans 12.3? Yes. Uh, when everyone is born again, they are given a certain measure of faith. And then that measure can increase or it can decrease according to how a person uh, meditates and, and continue to obtain the substance of God or the, uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Pastor, I do have another quick question. Um, here in the U.S., um, you know, we have a, a crisis like they haven't, um, it's been a, a baby formula shortage of over 43%. And I'm wondering like, Lord, like, like why could something like that happen and what's going on? And I know with all the abortion laws and the big race to rule um, on the Roe versus weight, have God given you any word about what is the what is this going on about the, the baby formula shortage? Because these are babies and babies have to eat and that's a little bit disturbing. And, and yeah, has God given you a word about that? Uh, not in a specific sense, but more in a general sense that there is a famine coming and it is the seven year famine. And we haven't reached the urgent level of food shortage yet. Uh, under food shortage, there will be shortage of different things, including the baby food for babies, food for this and food for that. And not only that, there will also be a pollution of the food so that some food could not be used anymore. And uh, so food, clothing and shelter, especially food, will be in the times of famine, uh, a necessity that is hard to find. And... Uh, so, but those who love the Lord, the Lord will still provide. Even if the Lord had to multiply, like he multiplied the oil and the flour, he will still do so. And so then we can pray for those uh, who love God or who are in need. Question here, there's a society called, uh, wait now, it has run. Uh, it's a society called Broody Hoss, founder, uh, 
set, uh, set up a community, Christian community based on acts as you just thought. It was fraught with many challenges over the more than century existence. Was this more inspired by God as a shadow of what's come or just a Christian's desire for utopia? Uh, your last word is a Christian desire for utopia. Not only that, you probably heard of John Alexander Davi. He tried to set up an entire Christian city, not just a community, a Thai city. It's called Zion in USA. And he's a very influential towards the turn of the century. But what he wanted to do was more in a millennium. It would not be possible. And we are not going to do things like that. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we have a trans-denominational, transnational group of people who have come to Christ. And the Lord will supply a lot of blessings and prosperity. And we will have a governance of that uh, supply in distribution. Just like they had the seven uh, deacons distribute to the widows, we would have uh, a group of uh, representations from all the planet Earth distributing to all the needs of those in, uh, nations of glory so that there'll be no poor people in their midst. All food, clothing, and shelter is met. And uh, then and all the salaries... Uh, of those who serve God full time is, is always paid so they got more than sufficient for themselves and for, for doing more things. And, uh, the, and also people who can serve God full time. We have millions of fivefold ministries. We have millions and billions of worshipers. And all those can spend their time if they want to 24 hours serving God without worrying about food, clothing, and shelter. They will have a house of their own. They will have food, uh, and they can live a normal life, all provided, and serve God full time. And so that's what uh, we envision. And uh, uh, God has given a vision that. And the reason it failed many times is because the people who administrate themselves get corrupted. And so we will have a group of people who God raised who are incorruptible and also a group of people who God raised who will not need these things because they are transformed. They will be more uh, living above the laws of this earth, but they will remain serving those who need to learn more about the laws beyond all those things. They don't need to eat, don't need to sleep. Um, they don't need transportation because they can transport themselves in this manner. So those group of people will definitely help to better govern. The best people to distribute wealth and prosperity are those who don't need it themselves. Next question. Hello, I have a question. I was reading about King Saul uh, when he visited the witch of Endor. How is it that a witch summoned a saint? Was it truly Samuel speaking to Saul or a masquerading spirit? Uh, firstly, this question had been asked before, but I will summarize the answer. Firstly, in that incident, the Bible says Samuel. So if I accept the literal translation of the Bible, it would mean that Samuel actually appeared. And then I have to answer the other question. How can Samuel appear when this is like a uh, illegal seance which God forbade? Uh, that is number two. That is why the witch herself was shocked because the real one appeared. She was trying to, of course, conjure some evil masquerading spirit. And most of the seances today that are done, they are not the real people. They are demons who are familiar with those lives, imparting knowledge that they have obtained from the human lives. And so the woman, you notice, is shocked. And because she never expected the real Samuel to show up. And uh, instead, the real one show up and the demons did not show up at all. So Samuel appeared not because of what the women did, but because... God just want to give a final judgment to King Saul. 
and uh, whatever the witch do uh, had no effect and the witch herself was stunned and shocked uh, by the real appearance and not the familiar spirit that she has been working with. And of course, King Saul himself had fallen so low into sin that he has gone into disobeying God in this area and notice the pronunciation of that was judgment upon him. And Samuel did say that he will soon join Samuel you know, in the valley of death. Good morning, and let me see this question. I have four questions, wow. They are related to prayer and meditation. Number one, what is your intake on people who pray in tongues while working compared to serving specific hours of praying without doing anything? I think this question has been answered. So let me give a simple answer. Is that um, um, when you are praying in tongues and doing something else, except for just walking, I had a long two hour walk and pray. And you know, when you walk, you don't have to think about anything. Uh, that one is like praying long. But when you have to do something like you're working, you're doing housework or, or doing something or driving, um, I call that maintenance prayer because you cannot go that deep. I mean, when you're driving, you, pray in time, you go so deep, you cause an accident. So it's all maintenance prayer. But to actually go deep, you must be like all night, nothing on, just concentrating on prayer and just go for it. So a specific hours of prayer without doing anything is much, much deeper than maintenance prayer. And so second question, is there, it should be, are there, uh, is there a thing, are there things as a special time to pray? Example, 6 a.m., 9 a.m., 12, etc., 7 or 8. Or as compared to praying all night like our Lord Jesus and what has greater spiritual impact. Throughout the whole Bible, um, morning has always been emphasized as a wonderful time to pray. And that's one. And then Jesus has prayed all night, many times. So all night is emphasized. But there is in the Bible, the evening sacrifice. So a lot of things happen in the evening sacrifice. And also in Daniel's life, you have uh, the nights of, of, of visions. And so when you look at all four, there are mornings emphasized in the Bible, and uh, then there are all-night prayers, then there are evening sacrifices, which probably 6 p.m. or so, and then you have the nights when Daniel has his visions. When you look at it, using these Bible stories, we could say each of those prayers seems to have their own special uh, phenomena. That means that it's like uh, eating different meals, uh, eating a burger, having chicken rice, or having a bowl of soup are all different things. But we all alternate our eating. So praying at different times does seem to impact certain things. Uh, but uh, to favor one above the other would be wrong. So I would recommend having a specific time of prayer and a specific number of hours of prayer more than anything. So that answers question two. Let's see where's number three. Okay. What is the difference uh, between person who prays five hours nonstop and one who prays two hours, 30 minutes for two times. What spiritual effect does it have? The difference is like a plane. If a plane flies two hours and 30 minutes, then stop, and then flies two hours and 30 minutes and stop, the plane might take longer to reach a destination. Whereas a plane that flies five, five hours nonstop, and in total, a plane actually flies 
further. And so uh, the longer hours a person spend in prayer, they can go further and deeper. The shorter has a certain limit. But this is in proportion to the spiritual level of a person. So the higher a person is spiritually, they might take two hours while someone takes five hours to reach the same plane. So there is that additional uh, differential I threw in. Next question, where is your number four? Okay. What effect does it have to record yourself meditating and listening while working as compared to meditating without with work with without or without working or distraction? What is best? Okay, the same as in prayer. If you uh, record and play for yourself, it does help more than the subconscious side. But you still cannot go as deep as when you solidly meditate without distraction, just like the prayer side. Okay, you have answered the question. Let's look at the next one. How would the availability of free food, clothing and shelter affect homeless in these end times? We will eliminate homelessness. Everyone is provided shelter. Of course, uh, we are not uh, inexperienced. We know in every system, there's abuse of the system. So we will find ways to minimize the abuse, plus the angels are going to work alongside us too. But you eliminate homelessness when you provide shelter. You eliminate needs when you provide food and clothing. So you won't just minimize, you can eliminate it uh, to a certain extent, the kingdom of God. Soul winning is separate. Soul winning is a presentation of the gospel in all its full glory. Uh, next one, is this positional grace the same when we could say someone is grace to sing? No. That would be a, a different area of grace called gifts, where a person is grace-led. The word gives is charisma, which can literally be translated as gracelets, which you're using grace as a verb right now. Grace to sing, grace to plant churches, grace to evangelize. These are gifts. Now, when you illustrate uh, positions of planting churches as apostles or evangelists, then it looks like they are grace into a position a spiritual position. Uh, but you will find that in the book of Galatians 2, Paul speaks about this charisma grace to be apostle as working inside a person. So I would say that charisma or gracelets uh, are the gift of the grace is totally another point different from point two. Okay, next question. Thank you for answering this question, sir. Pastor, what are practical ways that allow you to grow in grace and favor with God from where you're 20 years away you are got now that you can tell to follow? Uh, wow, that's not an easy answer. I would say uh, you watch the lives in the Bible that grow in grace and favor. And they are the life of Jesus himself. And the Bible says Jesus was full of grace. And that means Jesus was the word. And I would say that if you read the book of Proverbs, it talks about how wisdom puts a crown of grace upon our head and a necklace around us. And so wisdom, which comes from the word. And so to grow in grace and favor, I believe, is to get more word into our mind, our heart, our being. As that word becomes us, grace will result. 
I think there's also a Bible verse in Peter that says, I believe Second Peter that says, grow in the grace of God, our grace be multiplied upon you through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can multiply grace through the knowledge of Christ. And so a grace seems to be directly connected to growth in the word of God. By word, I don't mean intellectual word. By word, I mean that the word become a part of your soul, a part of your flesh. And so that is like, you just keep on looking and looking and meditating and eating the word. Um, as I do have uh, one more question. Um, when, when God speaks to you very sternly, what, what, what does that mean? Sternly, like, sternly, you're talking about when God speaks sternly? Yes, sternly, like very sternly. Like I was going through something um, the other week and I just felt very, dist <laughs> very disturbed in my inside. And I know that the Lord noticed that. So he said to me, be still, I am the Lord. And, and I heard that so crystal clear. And I'm like, wow, you know, <laughs> thank you, Jesus. But, you know, when he said it, it was very stern. And I said, oh, my God, I said, thank you, Jesus. And I just kept still. And the Lord's voice that has always been like a shepherd. And the only time he has spoken sternly in the Bible to his disciples is when he's correcting something or he's calming a storm. So maybe in your life, he was calm in a storm. So he spoke with more authority. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, God told me that I have to be more disciplined. Um, and I know he's disciplining me. And that's why I thank you for your messages last week. Because you spoke about, I think it was weaknesses. Um, because I'm learning how to recognize my weaknesses. It was such a blessing. Because you mm -hmm. said that um, race equal weaknesses equal perfection. Grace plus weakness equal perfection. So that yeah. really helped me last week, you know, because it's like you said, you know, we have to learn our weaknesses as well, you know. So maybe I guess that's why he's speaking a little bit sternly to me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Knowing our weaknesses produces uh, a sense of humility when we recognize our own frailty. And yeah. that helps in the humbling process. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Well, praise the Lord. And we pass uh, time to call in for his words of wisdom. So, Pastor, just now you touched on uh, growing in grace uh, through the question that was asked, and uh, part of it is increasing in the word. Um, so, Jesus was, uh, I mean, it, it is written that Jesus came full of grace and truth, and he grew in grace and wisdom. So, uh, it looks like Grace grows together with the wisdom and with truth. Uh, is there a part where people, if they have received grace, but if the truth is not enough, they go out of balance? Is, is there such a, a problem? Uh, the, the answer is yes. Besides grace and truth, uh, grace and truth be like the, an aspect, truth being related to love. And then in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied upon you through the knowledge of God. So grace has combined with different things. It's grace and truth, grace and peace, grace and faith. Um, all these different combinations have, have been important. Um, as you know, grace will be the seven spirit of God and uh, an aspect of the, a different dimensional aspect of the spirit of mercy. And the seven spirits have always worked together. So when we refer to the chart of the seven spirits, remember seven spirits, seven spirits, and 
how they combine together twins of them, mm. uh, the male and feminine version, uh, we can see the multiplying effect uh, of where grace is important. Mm. I see, you mean. So uh, the other part is uh, Paul talks about he is what he is by the grace of God. So he has become what he is through that grace of the substance that already been absorbed into his life so that uh, he has the positional grace and the substance of grace together. Um, yes. It was Paul who said, it's no longer I who lives. So he definitely understood the grace that was moving within him. Hmm. Okay, it's like leave, uh, letting the grace transform us and uh, to the extent that what we are is really no longer that the, the old self, the, the old man, like Paul says, the new, put on the new man. Yes. Mm. Okay. This question that just came in. Good morning, Pastor. Thank you for the teaching. Most times when I'm listening to someone teaching, I get sleepy, and in those few seconds of sleepiness, I see visions. Always wonder if that's how it should happen. I don't necessarily miss information we share. We can drowsy, but through teaching, when reading, listening, it's a way to minimize the sleepiness. Uh, no. Um, uh, that sleepiness, probably, you need to... Uh, Address it through your own life in prayer. And uh, it takes a certain attentiveness to not fall asleep during a time of preaching. But most people just don't have enough sleep anyway, or don't have enough rest. And that is why uh, now in a time of sermon, uh, everything is so soothing that uh, uh, they just fall asleep. And even, let's say, even all night, many people have micro-sleep and they saw visions and all that. I myself guilty of micro-sleep too, sometimes when tired and all night prayer. But I still persist in praying. And the fun, good thing is in micro-sleep, you still see some visions and you come out of it. Uh, and the Lord rewards you for, for attempting to continue. So thank you for sharing that. And... Uh, you can only minimize that by having enough rest. The average person is not having enough rest, actually. Um, Pass, I have one more last question. This mm -hmm. is my last question. Okay, so when we have out-of-body experiences, it's like what I had here when I was walking around my house. Um, is that considered the anointing within or the anointing upon? I would think it's anointed with him. Is it, am I correct? Or? Uh, when you're out of body experience, it usually works with the anointing upon. Oh, it's wow. something that takes you outside of your body. And uh, it needs, uh, for Christian out of body experience, OBEs, it needs the angelic work. And angels always work uh, through the anointing upon. Anointed upon. Hmm. So, so could you give me an example? If that's an anointed upon, then what would be a good example of the anointed within? Because I'm a little bit confused. About that. Uh, in the Old Testament, they only had an exa have examples of anointing upon. But when you see Ezekiel being taken in the spirit, each time he was taken, at one time the angel even hold to his hair and took him along. So all those examples of anointing upon, and that was the only anointing that they were able to carry uh, in, the, in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there was um, Philip, he was preaching and he was transported. That's an anointing upon. And um, when Jesus uh, walked on water and when he reached the boat, and when he got into the boat, instantly the boat was transported with all the people to the shore. 
that was an anointing upon that flow from Jesus into the boat and transported that. Example of anointing will then would working with anointing upon would be Paul bringing healing to the man in Acts 14. He has to sense from within and he has to sense anointing upon. So uh, both were working together uh, at that time. When Paul was struck in a Damascus road, it was anointing upon because that was the first time he encountered the Lord and his eyes could not see because he's exposed to the glory of God. But Paul was conscious of the anointing within him that provoked him. I believe around uh, Acts uh, chapter uh, 17, when he was in uh, uh, Athens, his spirit was provoked to speak about the unknown God. So there was a sturdy anointing within uh, that stirred him. And then when he started speaking, the anointing upon came upon him. Okay, okay. So, uh, so what you're saying is that you know when I was walking around my house, it was an angel involved in that. Yes, you oh, were okay. not alone. You might not see the an angel. You might remain invisible, but you never could do that without angelic help. Right. I, I, <laughs> I know because when I went to one room, you know, of course, when I left the light off in there, it, I, I saw it was dark. So I started to feel a little fearful, but then. I walked in the room. I just felt this authority. I walked in the room and I pleaded the blood of Jesus and I knew it my room. So I, I knew it had to be a, something else helping me. Mm -hmm. I just felt it. And, um, you know, and then I got up and waved my hands. It was kind of like shocking a little bit because when I started waving my hands, because uh, I because I felt like that something was telling me, I, know it was, I thought it was the Lord. I didn't, I, <laughs> I didn't know it was an angel, um, but I, he told me just to wave my hands up and I did it. And it just cleared whatever it was that was that was going on. And when I went back to sleep, I just felt so much peace. I couldn't believe it. And then I had finally woke up in my body. And I said, hmm, it's peaceful. And I said, early, so what did you just do? <laughs> so it was a little bit shocking. But I guess mm. I have to get used to it. You know, you have to get used to that, especially yes. if you're not used to working in that type of dimension. Is, is that considered mm. a realm or dimension? Mm. I mean, that's, is, is that a realm? or a dimension? Oh, um, just a spiritual realm. The spiritual realm, okay. Yes. Okay, okay, thank you, Pastor, I'm so sorry. No. It's <laughs> like we all family, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you. Colleen, any other concluding marks? So Pastor, in order for us to function well in the uh, grace of the Lord, uh, the balance with the other parts like the peace, the, uh, the truth, or the wisdom, all those has to be, uh, I mean, I guess, uh, uh, work in as a good foundation, right? So then, mm. you know, the, the grace can function uh, fully. Correct. Okay. Yes. So, Pastor, um, this was... Just now thinking because uh, I was talking about Peter and his certain characteristic, and uh, actually there's twelve disciples, and you know we got uh, twelve tribes, and previously you have taught teach us about the twelve tribes, the different um, they also have different characteristic, and um, is it so that um, this relates to uh, different grace that the Lord wants to give to us in our uh, so, so that uh, our soul can receive like maybe 12 different pieces of uh, the grace that functions together uh, like the 12 disciples uh, and the 12 tribes. Um, have, did I, Pastor, have you thought about the, the uh, 12 disciples, you know, each one having their specific uh, characteristic, characteristic in their soul which uh, the Lord brings out uh, and we can receive? Uh, no, not specifically in that. But I've thought about humans, their souls are illustrated by animals. Yes, yeah, we recall that. 
Mm. 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 Okay, something interesting, I guess. <laughs> yes. The seven spirits were introduced in the book of Revelations. They have never ever been seen to be separate, only by the Apostle John. And when they work, they are like the Trinity. They never work alone. While one is working, the other are always in the background. Except that sometimes God emphasizes one of them, one aspect of them working for our benefit, for our understanding, for our sensation of what each of the spirit felt like. That's why you have grace and peace. You would have grace and love. You will have grace and, and glory. And uh, uh, Moses found grace in the sight of God. And he says, let me see your glory. And you would have grace and power, which you see in the book of Acts 5 and Acts 4. And then you will have grace and life. And uh, the abundant life uh, that comes with grace in Romans chapter 5. And then you will have grace and wisdom, the book of Proverbs chapter 8. When you have wisdom, you have grace. And then you would have grace and mercy, which is the throne of grace in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, the last verse. So all these are related into each other. Mm, amen, amen. Wow, the, the Lord's uh, teaching us that uh, the the balance is not just between horse and mule, but actually is uh, <laughs> between a, a lot of different uh, aspects. It can be four, seven, twelve, you know, different yes. different aspects um, that all has to be uh, in a in a good in a good balance for us to, uh, I mean, in a way, uh, show forth the perfection of the the Lord. Correct. Mm. The number seven and the seven relations always is the vertical uh, that is between us and God. And the four always refer to the uh, north, south, east, west, and the four creatures, always the horizontal version. And um, so both gives us dimension, uh, which allows us to experience God. Without our soul, we could not experience God. I'm, I'm Pastor, I'm just this view on the subject of the seven spirits of God. Um, do we, do the seven spirits of God carry a certain color? Like, do they have an aura? Yes, they have. In the spirit realm? Oh, okay, because I, I know, at least I read that the, uh, that the spirit of the fear of God, which God has been speaking heavenly with me about, has a color of violet or a purple. Is that true? Yes, they all have uh, various colors. And sometimes, though, the perception of colors might be individualized. Mm -hmm. But generally, they do have an objective colors. So you can say that the seven spirits have an objective color from God's perspective, but they also have some level of subjective colors as they interact into a human life. Mm -hmm. so, so when we see um, a spirit with a color, um, what, okay, that's like one time I saw a guardian angel beside my door and I knew it was a guardian angel because it looked like a statue. It looked like somebody put a statue in my room, like a cement statue. It was so tall and the wings were spread and it had a bluish glow. And he was standing there with his hands across his chest, like he was guarding something. Like he was like on guard, like his hands were crossed, like. If he was to put the hands across his chest, like you want to protect yourself, that's how he was standing. But he had a bluish glow. So was that the color of the heavenlies? I mean, was he a part of Archangel Michael? Um, well, uh, it is It is more uh, to do with uh, the heavenly color, as you perceive. And it's also the dimension that he is manifesting in. Uh, if you ever see the angel in Revelation 10, he has a reddish glow. 
And it doesn't mean that he didn't have the heavenly aspects because he looked to God and say, uh, and spoke about how the prophecy will be fulfilled on the earth. And so sometimes it relates to the work that they are doing, the colors, not where they are from, but what they are doing. Mm-hmm. So, so is it true that when you see the angel with a certain color ray, does it mean from their certain art angel ray? Like was that like the angel that I've seen? Was it a part of Archangel Michael's ray? Uh, no. their, Angel it doesn't Michael, mean that. Uh, Angel Michael has a very silky, uh, silky whitish aura. Uh, but he can be seen in different lights sometimes by different people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you, Pastor. Okay. I think there's one question there, Pastor. I just want to ask how you identify the working of angels in the Bible, especially when they are specifically mentioned, like in Ezekiel. He said he saw a hand and figure of a man, and he said it was actually the angel that lifted him uh, by the hair. Okay, let me uh, give you the verse there. And um, In the book of Ezekiel, okay. Let's have Ezekiel. How about Ezekiel uh, chapter eight, verse three to you? He stretched out the form of a hand and took me by a lock of my hair. I say that he took Ezekiel by his hair. Do you see that verse? So you say there's a hand, there's a man, but do you read the part where he took Ezekiel by the hair? Ezekiel 8 verse 3. So I appreciate if you check in the Bible. You can use a concordance to find it because your question looked like, you know, it didn't happen. But that's the verse there. It took Ezekiel by his hair and the spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven. So hair is mentioned in the Hebrew. No worries. Yeah, praise the Lord, Ezekiel. Okay, Pastor, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I do have one, one more question. Um, when I was praising God, you know, um, um, last week when I was at work, I, I knew it was an angel standing right there beside me. I, I knew it. It was so close to me, right there beside my chair. I knew it was there. I felt it was there, but I couldn't see him. Mm. So, 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 <laughs> so my question is, and I'm not trying to, you know, um, you know, I know I have to be very careful because I know I'm real sensitive in the spirit, but when am, I don't know if I'm asking this the right way, but what is happening? Like, when am I going to start seeing them? Um, uh, what, right when there. you worry about seeing them, it prevents you from seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's a funny thing. Right. Uh, when you just enjoy their presence, whether you see them or not, it helps. Mm-hmm. And sometimes angels like to work without you seeing them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. They have all different personal characteristics. And by the way, the archangel of COG, which is under him are 10,000 other angels that will be all part of the angels in different churches. Uh, yes, they are related to Michael in some way, uh, but the archangel of COG and COG angels have a bluish glow. So you may be seeing uh, one of the angels of COG. Oh, wow. Who's working with you because you're a part of the church. Yeah. 
well, um, and do you, well, I mean, sometimes I kind of think, okay, are they don't want me to see them? Because sometimes they know I can be a little excited, mm -hmm. um, a little extra. <laughs> um, I can get a little bit excited, you know, about things. And, and I know that God wants me to stay very grounded. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to you know, prevent myself from seeing it. Because sometimes I have so much joy when I worship. I just like, I just want to just go up. You know, I just feel like I just want to just go running. Um, I have so much energy. And um, so I'm, I'm really trying to just stay grounded. Um, yeah. Yeah. Enjoyment is more important. So enjoy the presence of the Lord and let things just happen as they happen. Mm -hmm. That's the best position to be. It is, it's, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. <laughs> Especially when you have that enjoyment of praising the Lord like I do. And, yes. you know, you and you enjoy his presence and you don't want to come out of his presence. So, you know, I could um, really appreciate what Elder Colin was preaching about earlier when he was talking about procrastination, because I really didn't need to hear that, because sometimes I, I guess I'm just the opposite. I stay in the presence of God so much that I do procrastinate on doing natural things <laughs> because I love being in the presence of God so much. Sometimes I don't get the natural things done. And to me, that's procrastination, you know, so I have to have that balance um, to get the natural stuff I need to get done, you know, like go run errands or do things around the house. And, you know, so I, I do appreciate what, what Elder Colin said, because that really helped me tonight. So it's making me you know, more aware that I need to get other things done as well. Yeah. Amen. Praise the Lord. We will conclude with uh, uh, some of the thoughts that are provoked from uh, words of wisdom from uh, our dear Colin. And uh, uh, the grace of God relates to all the seven spirits. And um, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto each one. There's a multiplication. And grace and peace is usually a combination to create growth in our lives. Uh, growing in various aspects. And then there's grace and truth. And that you'll find in John chapter 1 in Jesus is full of grace and full of truth. That has to do with godliness and uh, becoming more of a, a transparent vessel where God's presence flow out from us. And so it's slightly different. It is like uh, uh, impartation of uh, the God factor of the godliness in and through our life. So uh, God and truth are like synonyms because God does not lie. The devil is the opposite. The devil is a liar always. And he perverts truth. And so all truth even the spirit is called the spirit of truth. And, uh, and that's the working of the Holy Spirit into our lives. And unless we have the word in our life, word make flesh, unless we are truth, all the work of the Holy Spirit cannot flow out. So it has to do with impartation uh, into our life. And then uh, grace and uh, joy that the Lord has for us where we... Uh, tremendously have joy increase in other life. And uh, it's uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 that talk about how this joy is abundant in him and you find it related to grace. And joy has to do with grace helping you through the most difficult times. And, uh, and Paul was in prison and Jesus says that when you're persecuted, live for joy in the book of Luke chapter 6. So grace, the grace to rejoice is uh, an overcoming grace. It's a grace that helps you triumph over tough situations, uh, uh, tough valleys, uh, between a rock and a hard place. It's uh, grace working out to you, exploding to you. 
grace and power you saw in the book of uh, Acts chapter 4, it brings signs and wonders and grace and power combined. And then grace and life in Romans 5, when it combines together, it makes you into a king. You rule and reign in, uh, as God, grace and life. Grace and wisdom, Proverbs chapter 8, they are like preparing you for spiritual rewards. And you are crowned with grace. You, are, you, you have a necklace around you all through the spirit of wisdom and wisdom and grace. Wisdom takes grace and makes it into ornaments around you. You become, uh, uh, you become a heavenly person. Grace and uh, mercy in Hebrews 4, you are at the throne room. It brings the, the throne room presence into your life. So be blessed by all these aspects of grace in the seven spirits. And um, thank you, Colin, for sharing that. And uh, thank you, everyone, for participating in questions and answers. And we pray that we all continue to grow and multiply in grace. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for grace and your mercy. We bless each one here. We ask that your work of grace, multiplied through the seven spirits, will be great and efficient upon each one. That at the end of the day, we can say it's not us, but Christ in us. That at the end of the day, all pride is crushed in the powder and we become humble like Jesus as servants to one another, just giving you all the glory, worship and honor. So we bless you and thank you, Father, and ask that we all increase in grace. We bless you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Amen. God bless each one of you. And uh, have Thank a great you, Sunday or Saturday Thank night. Thank you, Pastor. Bye-bye, Pastor. Thank, Thank you, Pastor. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Bye. Thank you, Pastor.